Welcome to Partial Differential Equations, lecture number two. And today we're going to go on with the first order systems. And last, in the introductory lecture, you had just had an idea of what basic partial differential equations are. And we're now going to find, look at the general way to solve all first order systems. And we're going to restrict it to two variables, however many of the ideas you can actually do in higher dimensions as well. Um, so if you recall the last problem that we ended on um, yesterday, we had that you had a, um, the advection equation, you had an initial condition that's displayed over here. Here this is times t equal to zero, it was just a Gaussian. And then as you let it go, um, the solution to the equation was basically the values of this initial condition displaced along parallel lines in time. Okay, and so you had the very definite idea that this point basically fixed the values for the whole solution along that particular line, and that point fixed the value for the whole solution along that line. And we knew that we could find an arbitrary function. We proved that the last lecture, and that arbitrary function is thus fixed by your initial conditions. Okay, so there it is, the equation that we had. We had our characteristic lines, which are just those horizontal lines where the solution remains constant. And we wrote down the general solution, which is basically a function of the characteristic line you are on. So the general solution then becomes f of x minus ct. And this f is fixed by um, the initial conditions, which in this particular case was chosen to be a Gaussian. Okay, and so what we're going to do now is generalize this more um, for all cases, first order cases. First in the semi-linear or quasi-linear case and then generally because this quasi-linear case illustrates the method we use very nicely and there's an added complexity when you go to full generality. Okay, so this is just the picture that I drew there is the graph of the solution is simply a wave propagating to the right and the velocity is constant. Okay, and so this first order linear equations, we're basically going to use the classical reference of Fritz John PEs, and it, most of the stuff comes from chapter 1.4, just possibly illustrated with um, more colorful examples, I guess. Um, but it's really a classic theory, and it's very, very useful, and it's useful to have in your back pocket. It started the thinking, before, it was before manifold, before anything existed, this thing was designed. And it started a lot of the thinking about differential equations and how you view a solution and what a solu solution actually is. And so we'll just sort of um, pull out the main ideas there. Okay, so just to recap, our general first order PDE, we simply can write it in this form. It's basically a function of your independent variables, your unknown dependent variable and its first order derivatives. And... Um, the solu there is a theorem which we'll now prove first in a special case of quasi-linear and then in the general case in the subsequent lecture that the general solution can be obtained to this thing um, by solving ODEs. So you can take something that's dependent on two variables, um, is a whole combination of these things, um, is any linear or any nonlinear function of all these things, and you can reduce that problem to solving ODEs which there is an existence proof and a uniqueness proof for. So you basically have reduced the problem to a solution, at least locally. And that's what we're going to do. This is not true for higher order equations. This is unique to first order equations and unique to uh, having only one dependent variable. It's not true for systems of equations either. Okay. Um, but it is very, very useful. And a lot of the studying of equations initially started by looking at these systems and understanding them fully because you could write them down. And in fact, a lot of our intuition about shock waves, even in higher order equations, actually comes from understanding this thing as well. Um, so, which is the reason I include it and many of the other um, texts just jump to special examples, but it is very, it, based, it formed the foundation that people generalized later on to look at second order systems and things like that. Okay, so we're going to start with a simpler quasi-linear case. And by um, quasi-linear, I basically mean that it is linear in the highest order derivatives um, of the independent variable. 
but it may be non-linear in the independent variable itself. In other words, so the quasi-linear equation basically has this form. It ha is linear in the high the derivatives, but you can have any function of your independent variables and your dependent variable over there. And so you can write it this way. So it's unknown functions A, B, C, and then linear in your um, derivatives. Okay, so it's quite a large class of equations, and it includes the invection equation that we looked at um, in the first, and we basically recap now in the f um, before I started the formal part. Okay, so the way the argumentation goes, and this is actually something that generalizes to the general case as well, is you can view this function u that you're solving for as a surface in three dimensions. Okay, so you can say it's a surface, you said your z variable equals to some function u of x and y, and that then represents the solution. And the moment you do that, um, you can have a geometric intuition of what this equation actually means. And then the beautiful way is they actually use that intuition to solve the equations. Okay, So the solutions to the partial differential equation, we then call the integral surfaces. So those, these, the z equals to the solution is called integral surfaces. And um, the moment you have a surface, you can define the normal to it. Okay, So the normal to a surface is just the function that describes the surface's gradient. And so here we have the function that describes the surface is basically u x y minus z is equals to zero. The gradient of that thing gives you the first, the two derivatives with minus one because that's what the equation for the surface is like. Okay, so that's the normal vector to the surface. And um, the functions on your um, quasi-linear equations, namely a, b, c, and c, they basically define a field of vectors in x, y, and z space. Okay, so you now go and you replace u here with z because that's what's true on your integral surface. And you basically have three functions um, in x, y, and z. And we're going to combine those three functions into a vector space. Okay, and we're going to call that vector tc, which is simply the entry of a and the entry of b and the entry of c. Okay. And the reason for doing that is that allows us to actually get the geometric equation of what this thing means. Because if you look carefully now, oh, just sorry, we call this TC the characteristic direction of the quasi-linear equation. Um, so what we do now is we use this TC and the N um, to actually um, describe what this equation means geometrically. And so just to orientate yourself, Here's the solution surface, so that's z. This is the normal, so that's n, which is the group basically ux, ui, minus 1. Um, and tc, um, we're going to explore now, right? And just the other geometric idea is that your tangent vectors lie within the surface, and you'll be familiar with that very much so from last semester um, <laughs> at nauseum, in fact. But what the quasi-linear equation is basically equivalent to is tc dotted n with n is equals to zero. So that immediately means that um, tc um, lies within the tangent space of these vectors, of your surface. Okay, so at each point the integral surface is tangent to the characteristic direction. So this quasi-linear equation is entirely equivalent to this condition. Okay, so we've changed what the quasi-linear equation was to a geometric description, and we're going to use that fact now to solve it. Just a caveat when you... Um, this was developed before our idea of manifolds, this way of solving it, and you can in fact see where, why the tangent space that we talked about in the... Um, sensor analysis course plays such a fundamental role because people already understood that you could use this type of argumentation to solve equations. Okay, so it's not, mathematics didn't develop in little pinnacles, it was a natural progression and the people that worked on this then went on and found different aspects of it like Jacobi and all those things and many of the stuff that you, or quantities that you now get easily out of tensor analysis were actually identified just ad hoc 
by people that were trying to solve the differential equation. So it fits together very, very nicely. Okay, so before we go on, in fact, I'll just remind you um, of what the parametric curves are in three space. It's basically you have a curve, it's a parameterized curve, so all you do is um, specify the coordinates of the curve as a function of the parameter. So you can describe, suppose you have this increasing helicoid, you can simply say that the curve gamma of t is simply the coordinates x, y, and z of t specified at a specific time. And um, the tangent to the curve is simply how this is changing with time. Okay, So just that's what your tangent is. And um, for this specific example, the x, y, and z are merely um, basically a helicoid. So I'm going to say let r of t, which is the radius, be 3 plus a factor that increases with time. And then I'm going to say gamma is simply r of t, so that um, cos of t, sine of t. So that's makes what makes it spiral. Um, the radius increases with time, and it goes upward in time. Okay. And then you can immediately, just by taking the derivative, you can write down the tangent vector of it. So this is just a little refresher of dealing with curves in three space, and that's all we'll need for now. Um, but yeah. So what an, a way of looking at an ordinary differential equation, um, in fact, a very nice way, also a geometric way, is if you're given the tangent vector to a curve, the, an ordinary solving an ordinary differential equation is the same, or a system of ordinary differential equations is the same as saying that you then want to find the curve itself. Okay, and there is the uniqueness theorems, you can always do that, and that's been proven. Okay, so now that we have the curve, or the idea of what a curve is, we're going to go back to our partial differential equation that we showed had a geometric identity and try and construct the solution and then prove that it is the solution. And the way we use do that is characteristic curves. Okay. So in the previous slide I basically said that given t you can always find the curve or you can always find the curve gamma to which it is tangent and we have a very natural t that we've specified from our differential equations. So the natural thing and we, we even got the clues, we called it the characteristic direction. The natural thing is to then solve that only differential equation. And what we're basically going to do is then we're going to construct the full solution to the um, PDEs from that solution. Okay. And this is basically the theorems that we developed during this, this lecture. Okay. So a couple of definitions. The family of characteristic curves... Um, that are tangent to the characteristic direction TC um, is what we're going to define now. So along a characteristic curve, you basically have that this relation works. Okay, This is basically you are solving the differential equation that ensures that your um, characteristic direction is tangent to your curve. Okay, So what you basically do to do that is you simply say the increase in x is proportional to a, or the ratio of the increase in x and a is proportional to the ratio of the increase of y and b e, and the ratio of increase of z and um, c um, is equal to the change in time. Okay. Um, a t is an arbitrary parameter that parameterizes your curve, and it can also this thing can also be written as an uh, autonomous system of equations where you've removed the time dependence because the time dependence doesn't appear in A, B, or C. That's an artificial parameter we've included, so it's natural that you should be able to solve the differential equations with no T being present. And that system looks like this. Okay. So, and you can even easily get that from here simply by looking at the various equalities and rearranging it. So this, this is what defines our characteristic curves. And it's exactly as I said, is simply you've taken the coordinates x, y, z, x, y, and z of t that parameterize the curve, you differentiate them, and then you've put them equals to the characteristic direction. Okay. So you want to solve that. Um, you, we're going to assume 
A, B, and C are of class C1. That's not a hard requirement. You can actually do C0 as well, but then you have to be careful, and the theorems don't work as easily. So it's just for being 100% rigorous, we're assuming uh, they C1. It's a lot of these things are actually true. Where's my cursor gone? A lot of these things are actually true if they see zero as well. Okay, and we're going to suppose we're working on a small region omega, and I'll tell you why we have restricted it to a region in a moment. And then from ODE theory, you basically have through each point in omega, it passes exactly one curve. So in ODEs, you should have had a uniqueness theorem. In other words, if you have a differential equation that looks like this, you can find, uh, there's a theorem that shows the solution exists locally, which is what the region comes from, um, and is unique, okay? And that you can prove for any system of um, homogeneous ordinary differential equations, or autonomous ordinary differential equations like this. Um, and we therefore use that in what follows, okay? So the moment you write, you've, you get these things from your, different, your partial differential equation, you write down this autonomous system and you guarantee that there's a solution and that the solution is unique. And that we're going to use as we go on. So we basically have that there's a three-parameter family of solutions to equation one, but that is actually only a two-parameter family or a two-parameter family because it doesn't matter. All the solutions basically include x equals to some function of x, y, z, and t plus a constant. So there are three constants associated with the three differential equations, and changing t to t plus a constant doesn't make a difference, so you can always drop one. Okay. So that rather than saying three, there's a two-parameter family of curves in x, y, and z space because you don't care. You care just about the curve. You don't care where you are on the curve. Okay. No, they have just written out the reason, okay, replacing t plus a t plus a constant doesn't change the so oh, it changes the solution but not the curve itself. Okay. So that's that then defines our characteristic curves, the differential equation, we can always find them. Um, and that's it. In fact, if you'll put the differential equation on the board or just write it down, you can actually just write it down for yourself. Um, Number one, because I use it again and then I don't give it to you. And it's just useful to see immediately that you substitute it. As, yeah, as, as I go on, it'll just be useful to have it. Okay, and then you can just remember that number one actually comes, the ABC comes from A times UX plus B times UY is equals to C. That's where the, the origin of the equation itself. Okay, um, right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to work out the theorems that actually describe the solution surface. So there's two parts to this proof. The first one says that if S, um, which defines the surface S, which we can describe like this, is the union of characteristic curves. In other words, all those curves that solve those equations that we said basically are two parameters, if they make a surface like this, then um, S is an integral surface. In other words, if S is the union of characteristic curves, S satisfies the condition that it obeys the partial differential equation. And so just to put that out, you can say um, the proof is through any point P in S, okay, we know that um, S is now defined as the union of characteristic curves, so P lies on a characteristic curve, okay? Um, and therefore, the tangent to the curve that passes through P lies in the tangent space of S at P, okay? And since... Um, the tangent um, of the curve at P um, has the characteristic direction, um, TC, therefore um, the normal N to S at P obeys that condition. Okay. 
So that's the going the one way. You're basically assuming you've made the surface at all the characteristic directions, and if you then have um, a point on that surface, you can always show that that differential equation holds because the tangent to the characteristic direction will be normal to the surface. Okay, so that's the one way. That's the easy way. The second part, oh, and therefore S is the integral surface because that's how we've defined what an integral surface is. Okay, this, the reverse part is a little bit longer to show, but the reverse is also, um, if you can show every integral surface S is the union of characteristic curves, um, or equivalently, every, um, th equivalently through every point of S, um, there passes a characteristic curves. So it's the, what's it, what do you call it, onto, it's, it's both ways. It's, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the surface S and the union of characteristic curves. Um, yeah, okay, and so we're just going to show the next part now. And it's quite useful, go back and understand carefully, draw the picture that you can actually see it, because it's very instructive, not only for this course, but for other things that have also happened. And it'll come back when we start looking at the more general case. Okay, so let's now prove the second part. So let us choose any point P, um, and this time we're assuming it lies on the integral surface, and we've said nothing about the characteristics so far. Okay, and so we define S to be the, the integral surface now, and we say let gamma be a characteristic curve through P. Okay, so we know at least... And you can always find a characteristic curve through P because you can choose P as your initial conditions and then you know there's a unique curve. What we now want to show is that this gamma actually relies, stays in S. Okay, and so basically that's what we want to prove. And the proof goes as follows. We can say, we can parameterize gamma um, and it basically solves one, which is the equation you've got in front of you. Um, and it has initial conditions x, y, and z, which passes through that particular point p at time t0. And what we're going to do now is we're going to say explore how this characteristic curve actually departs from S. Okay, so we know S is the surface, that's the integral surface. We know gamma pierces it at at least one point, and we're going to characterize how it moves away from that point. And to do that, we're basically going to say, let U um, be a Z of T, which defines the surface, um, minus U of um, X um, and T. Okay. And we can know that U at time T0, we've chosen the point through which the curve goes to be P, and we've chosen that point to lie on S, so U of 0 is fine, and um, what we're now going to do is quantify the change using that equation 1, which defines what the characteristic curve actually is. So we work out du dt, and we simply take differentiate this guy, so it's dz dt minus the partial derivative of U with respect to x, times dx dt minus ui times dy dt, okay? And then what we then do is we know that we're traveling along the characteristic curve at this point, so we can replace dz dt, dx dt, and dy dt with their definition um, of what the characteristic curve actually is, so that basically becomes these constant functions, okay? So that's that one, a and b. Okay, the next step now is to replace Z, which we know lies on the um, characteristic curve, with this, the, with its uh, basically the departure of the, um, no, sorry, yeah, Z lies on the integral surface, sorry, and we're going to re replace Z with its departure along the geodesic minus this u of x and t, which we can evaluate. And so what we basically have over there is c of x and y over here, 
um, minus a of x and y u plus u x and y and um, this b of x and y u plus u of x and y and so what we have now is where x and y are fixed by gamma okay so they're not arbitrary they're the solutions to your characteristic equation and we know them and they are basically traveling along the curve and so what we have now is since u satisfies the quasi-linear equation if um, big u is equals to zero then this thing vanishes exactly okay because this is our quasi-linear equation then there and so we can actually see that if we start with u of t zero equals to zero then du dt is also zero okay and that then basically becomes a valid solution to this equation too so we can basically show that u is equal to zero is a particular solution to equation two and because solutions to an ODE are unique once we found the particular one through the point we're done okay so it's a very cute argument that basically uses all we have of ODE theory but it allows us to show this equivalence between saying that the characteristic curves remain within the integral surface so it's kind of powerful and it's also very powerful because we've said nothing about what the surface is itself. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so by any, that's just, I've already said that. So, like, so we have both directions now that we've shown, which is kind of nice. So characteristic curves, the um, union of them is equals to equivalent entirely to the integral surface and vice versa. So now what we've done is we've given no specific solution. We have just explored the properties of solutions that obey that equation. Um, and so typically when we do partial differential equations, we have the idea of a general solution and its general properties, which is what I've described now. And then you have the idea of choosing a specific, which is, that's kind of abstract. You then have the idea of choosing a specific solution that actually satisfies initial conditions um, that you're interested in. And so the first one they generally, I think, is like the general problem. The second one where you are specifying initial conditions and boundary conditions and you want to solve for that specific solution, that's what they call the Cauchy problem. It's how you actually choose a real solution out of all the whole possible solution space. So the Cauchy problem for the quasi-linear equation is basically goes as follows. We have the general solution of the quasi-linear equation, which we basically describe by that integral surface, which is basically the union of all the characteristic curves, as we've just proved. And that's, as I said, the abstract thing. Um, and then we desire now to generate the specific solution. And the way we do that is um, we provide a set of data, which is typically our initial condition, or in the general, in the Cauchy case, with the most general case is basically you specify a particular curve on the solution surface. Okay, so you prescribe a function that's very similar to what we did with that um, advection equation and where I actually gave the, the um, Gaussian at the beginning. So that's what I mean by the data over here, is sort of what I specify to put into the problem that will then, the differential equation will then propagate out. Okay, so one way of specifying this data is to select the solution um, on a prescribed curve in X, Y, Z space. Okay, so I simply pick a curve, I specify what the solution is, and then I go to the differential equation and say, explore the possible, or the, find me the solution through that particular curve. Um, and that's what they call the Cauchy problem. It's the most general way to verse it for a continuous curve. In fact, it's the most general way. The argument is beautifully general. Okay, so what we're basically going to do now is we're going to prescribe this curve it's, which is contained in, t in the integral surface 
And the way we're going to do it is we're going to once again just parametrically define it. So we're going to say let gamma be parametrically defined, and we do it that way. So it's a different set of functions, it's a different parameter, but it's still a curve, so we just describe it in the following way. Um, and what we now seek is the solutions to the quasi-linear equation um, that is such that um, h of um, s equals to u of fs plus gs. In other words, we want it to be on, this is basically defining that it lies on the solution surface. Um, and that basically holds along the curve. Okay, so that's how we've translated this general specification of the curve into something that has meaning for our differential equation, and this just simply becomes then, in the special case where you're looking, th oh, this, this can also be an initial condition problem, but it's more general than that. Okay, and this particular is what they call the Cauchy problem. So let's just do it. So now suppose you had the solution surface, which is the union of all the characteristic curves. Somewhere on the solution surface, you're going to have this blue curve, which you call the Cauchy curve gamma. Okay. And for that curve, you're still going to have the normal to the surface, which is now the normal to gamma, as well as to the characteristic curves going along there. And you're still going to have the tangent space. And the uh, sort of the future music is it's a, there's some curves that you can choose that work well and actually let you solve the problem and there are other curves that are badly defined. Um, and we're going to work out the conditions for that as well. But anyway, the general picture is just this. You choose your Cauchy curve, you specify the data, and then you try and generate the characteristic curve that goes through this, that has this condition. Um, Okay, so let's just say this is just to get to the initial value problem. If we identify y with time and x with space, um, then one way of specifying this curve, gamma, is as follows. In other words, you have basically the x equals to s, y equals to 0, so time equals to 0, z equals to h of s, which is exactly the initial value problem we're using in the infection curve. So the, the idea of giving the initial condition is a special case of the Cauchy problem, but the Cauchy problem you can do more things with. Right, so you can basically say, I don't want to specify the wave just at the initial time, I want to specify one part of the wave at a, a certain point and a certain time, and then later I want to sort of make the wave specify the wave later on. And you can actually do that physically if you have something that's like drawing out the wave in time. Um, you can actually, and then you can let that propagate through. So the Cauchy way of viewing things is actually more general than just the initial condition. Um, okay, so we now seek solutions with u of x and 0 equals to h and x, um, as we did for the advection equation. So it's just to basically translate this more general thing into something that we'd already know. Okay, and that's called the initial value problem. So this question, or the Cauchy question of when solutions exist that have this property, and how you actually have to specify this curve is what we're going to answer next. In general, you have a lot of freedom to choose this curve. In fact, there's only one thing you cannot do for the solution to be well defined, and what you cannot do is if you ch happen to choose this curve to correspond with a characteristic direction, because then you have specified two pieces of information. Either that curve must be the characteristic direction, or it's not going to lie on the surface. Okay, so that's when it breaks down. But let's just see how that happens formally mathematically, and we won't see it today. We are done. And I'm out of slides. So I'll, I'll do that the next time, how you actually specify... Um, the conditions on the, um, the characteristic curve itself so that the problem is well defined. So yeah, that concludes lecture number two.